if you are a producer and you have found a script and you love the script and you want to get the movie made, then you want to reach out to try to find financing, distribution, or support, you would go look for people like us to help you. This is Ella Tier of the Independent Film School, interviewing filmmakers whose work premiered at the Toronto International Film Festival. Links below this video to join us for the many free trainings that we offer. Hello, we have here uh, Barry Mayorowitz. Did I say that right? Not yes. bad, not bad. <laughs> Pretend it's M-E-R-O-W-I-T-Z. Merowitz. Merowitz. Okay, I was just uh, telling Barry before we get started here that uh, Irena's Vow was a very personal film to me. I mean, it's such a beautiful film on so many levels. It's so, it has so many subtleties to it. It's so not overdone and yet it's just so powerful and it really gets you in the guts. But from my personal experience, my family um, survived World War, II, World War II in Romania because of an ally who risked her life. And I'm going to get a little choked up here. Um, but uh, she was someone that no one will ever hear about, and I don't even know her name. But she uh, pretended to be someone she wasn't to get my grandparents out of uh, death camps. and. Uh, she risked her life. You know, if they would have found out that she was faking her identity, she she wouldn't have made it. Choked up again, Barry. Look what you're doing to me. <laughs> um, so before we talk shop and films and all of that, if you could say to us a few things about what drew you to this film and what you love about it, what you're proud of in Irena's vow and having produced it. Yes, when, when my partner and I first read the script over seven years ago, it was unlike anything we had been involved with in the recent past. We are producers and distributors of films, but not historical dramas based on true facts. And we both read the script and looked at each other and said, we have to tell this story. The fact that it was based on this incredible true story that it took place around the Holocaust, but that the protagonist was a Polish Catholic woman, a young woman, you know, 19 year old girl, hmm. and that she put everyone else in front of her, uh, was just startling to us. It was just an incredible story. And then we started to learn more and more that you know, she didn't tell her story until the last 20 years of her life. Mm. You know, wow. she, she was liberated and then moved to the U.S. and had her family and a career. And it wasn't until one night where she was having dinner with her husband and her daughter and she, the phone rang and it was a student doing a random survey, just calling phone numbers, asking people if they thought the Holocaust was actually real. <laughs> Honestly, okay. Those days, people just called and picked up the phone. <laughs> Get the survey. And, and yeah. she said, can you believe that someone has the nerve to say that the Holocaust didn't happen? And that began Irena's journey to go on a, on a, became her mission to go and speak to schools and youth groups and communities about her experience in the Holocaust. And once she started talking, she never stopped. And that was the amazing part. <laughs> yeah, really spectacular. Oh, wow. Now I'm wondering about your history in film. You have produced and executive produced a lot of films. Yeah, almost 20 years of work behind you here. Let me, let me talk first, ask you questions just in terms of talking shop and then ask you more personal questions about your connection to your work. Um, I mean, these mystery titles that nobody understands, producer, executive producer, <laughs> What are the differences? What's the difference there? You have a lot of executive producer credits. Yeah. You're specifically a producer on Irena's Bow. If you can demystify that. Sure. The, the best way that I like to explain it is sort of looking at professional sports teams as an analogy. So if you think of the executive producer is sort of the president of the team or the team owner, they have oversight on the project, oversight on the team, 
but they're not necessarily rolling up their sleeves in day to day. The producer is the general manager. They're in charge of hiring the players and the coach and making sure that they've got all the right equipment. And the producer is really responsible for making sure the film comes to be what we all hope it to be. And in, in most of my career, you're right, uh, especially the beginning part, the first, first two third, three quarters, say, we were involved mainly as executive producers where we helped to put together the financing, make sure that we had the right team in place. And then we say to the producer, we trust you. We've boarded the project because of you and because of the cast and the script, and we're here to support you, but go make a great movie. So that's typically an executive producer role. And there are lots of different kinds of executive producers. Sometimes someone may invest in a movie and they get an executive producer credit. Someone may, it's pretty loose and liberal and, and frankly, there are way too many executive producer credits being given for certain movies. Mm -hmm. Whole other story. <laughs> they, they have a currency. Some people people want to see their names on screen, and they they sometimes will will uh, advocate for that. So we do that because in our normal course of business, as primarily distributors of films, when mm -hmm. we commission a film or we buy a movie before it's been made. We come on board as an executive producer because we're shaping that movie and helping to get it made. And that's mm. really what an executive producer is. They're, they're responsible for the source material, the financing, or for helping to put the whole movie together. Mm -hmm. Producer, on the other hand, is the person who is responsible for the movie. There are right. sometimes creative producers, which means that that producer is on set every single day, working with the director, making sure everything's okay. And there are financial and business producers who are not necessarily on set, but very involved in the day-to-day, -day, looking at the budgets every day, looking at making sure the cast is happy, making sure we have the right cast on board, the right crew. So there's lots of different roles in a movie. And you know, every movie is like a little business. Sometimes we have 200 people on a movie and you bring people together in a collaborative environment for four to, four to 12 weeks to put together a movie. And everyone has to dig in and really work well together. Right. And is it hugely varied or would you say there is a certain formula in terms of does the executive producer choose and find a producer to execute and complete and deliver the film? Or do producers run around looking for an executive producer who's going to bring in the financing and distribution? Every which way. Every which you way. Know, if you are a producer and you have found a script and you love the script and you want to get the movie made, then you want to reach out to try to find financing, distribution, or support, you would go look for people like us to help you. Right. Uh, with Irina's Vow as an example, the script came to us and we said we wanted to make it. So we put together the team, rolled up our sleeves. We still brought on other producing partners who would do more of the day-to-day, -day, and then we became a team of producers to help shape the movie. Mm -hmm. So it just every scenario is different in almost every movie, including studio movies, have different scenarios. Right, right. That makes sense. So steering over to the more personal side of it, how would you describe if there is some kind of a unifying theme or some through line uh, that your films have in common? Another way to ask it is, what what brings you, what gravitates you to certain projects and not others? I think the, the best way to say that the theme is completely arbitrary in that we like to say that we are agnostic in terms of the genre and the type of film. Many companies, many studios have very strict parameters around the films that they want to make or distribute. And we have said to ourselves early on that we want to look at every film as its own separate entity and do the research and the diligence to determine whether or not we think this is a film that we can put out in the marketplace that people will want to see that makes sense from a commercial standpoint and from a financial standpoint. Yeah. So we, there is no straight line theme through our movies. It's. You know, from comedy to kids and family to drama to sci-fi to horror to action, documentaries. Mm. Mm. And that also makes it more engaging for us and our team 
in that we get to work on lots of different material and with different people with different skill sets. So I, I actually enjoy that part of it a lot, but it has to make financial sense because it's a business. First and foremost, this is a business and we work in the business of film. So we have to make sure that if we're going to make something, someone wants to consume that product. Right. Yeah, that was the thing that struck me as I, as I looked at your credits. It struck me that you have such a diverse roster in terms of the kinds of films you make. So how, how do you know that a film makes business sense? If it was a science, then uh, <laughs> the studios and the multi-million dollar, you know, the Fortune 500 companies that own them would have made this into an institution. Have we, as we've seen over the years, and there have been lots of mergers and sales, and you know, a studio has to be backed by a massive corporation because the capital requirements are too huge for a standalone company to, to uh, weather on its own. Mm-hmm. But what do we look at? First and foremost, the material. It's just straightforward. Like, is the script, is the film compelling? Do we think that the team behind it, will the director be able to execute on the vision? Because we use the term, the translation from script to screen. A lot of scripts read really well. Can you envision it on the screen? Can the director, can the actors, who are you going to hire to play? Can you afford to hire them? How many days do you have to shoot? Where are you going to shoot? There's so many elements that form our package that we have to then determine Does it make sense for us to invest X so we can get a Y return? And 80, 90% of the films we look at, we don't pursue because it just doesn't make sense. And a lot of things have to line up for a movie to make sense. Right. 80, 90%. Yeah. It's a a lower number than I expected. (laughs) So you work, am, am I right that you work within like the half million to $5 million range? Is that roughly the range of the our, films? Our budget parameters are typically under ten million, is what we say. Oh, okay, that makes sense. So, what advice would you give to an emerging filmmaker? They're doing good work, and they're wondering what they should be doing. What would be your advice? And so, I over the years, I have been asked to meet with many young people who are friends of mine's <laughs> children or colleagues, etc. And you asked a really important question in that you said young filmmakers. And first of all, I'll broaden that out by saying people have always been attracted to this business. It's a sexy business, the film and television business. It looks fun. 10 years ago, there was a real business around it. Today, the business is very different and it's a much smaller business because there isn't any more home video and there's very little pay-per-view and so the opportunity to sell a movie during its lifetime have shrunk. Mm-hmm. Streaming business is the majority of the business today. So when someone wants to be in the business, there isn't really a business for them to be in. It's really us old timers and some other people who've been around for a while who are continuing to find opportunities because this market is massive, but it's dominated by huge companies and we are very small and we're I like to say we're minnows in the ocean trying to find opportunities. Mm. But the key is that the opportunity lies on the creative side. So Mm. for filmmakers, for writers, for budding directors, I believe that's where there's a real opportunity because more content is being produced and consumed. So my advice to them is to go and make something. Go and do something. Ask your parents, family, and friends. Make a short movie for 15. Do something so you can show and expose your talent. And hopefully that will get you an interview to work with someone else on a bigger project. And then do it again. And then do it again. And keep building your budget levels up. The first budget could be $5,000. You can make a movie on your phone today. Yeah. Keep working at the craft because it can't be conceptual. It has to be executed. Mm-hmm. And that's the, the advice that I give to most people is write, direct, act, produce, go and do something so we can actually see it and we can be visually, hopefully visually stimulated. Mm. Oh, yeah. That is so good. <laughs> that is what we say to our students repeatedly, like stop waiting to get discovered, build a body of work and 
Uh, if you do work that's meaningful to you and work with people you enjoy working with, you won't even care what it leads to or who does or doesn't discover you. You're going to be proud of the work you've created and enjoy creating it. Right. And, and don't think of it in the, in the process of creating it as an interim step. Yeah. Everything you have into making this piece of product, this piece of creative, the best it can be, that will take you far. Very good. Okay, one last talk shop question that everybody wonders about. Let's say I have this great script and I'm looking for a company like yours that's going to, you know, blah, blah, blah. Do people like you actually read scripts or is the first question, who's in it? Do you have an attachment? Like, should anybody even approach you before they have an attachment? Y yes and no. So we are sent unsolicited scripts all the time and we typically do not read them. We reply politely saying we don't do this. So the, the, the usual course of action that we prefer is that the film comes to us from a producer, mm -hmm. that someone has already embraced the script, the project wants to get involved with it. There doesn't need to be any further attachments. There doesn't need to be a director yet or even a cast yet, we will work collaboratively with the producer if we like it. Mm -hmm. However, the more elements that are in place makes our decision-making easier and more efficient because we can say, yes, they've got this director check and they've got this actor is interested and this actor signed. Otherwise it's a much lengthier process. Right. So we, we don't like to read, you know, someone just sent, I get an email. Every single day I get an email from someone, can I send you a script? And unfortunately we don't have the bandwidth nor the, the legal aspect of the business is a little challenging is that we want it to come through a bona fide person in the industry. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. And when you say we, Acute Media, that's the name of? Uh, the company that we, that are, is our um, external facing company is called Quiver Distribution. Quiver. Got it. Okay. And so when you say we, what does a company like that look like? It's you and like two partners or there's 40 of you or what does a company look like? Yeah, we're a team of 12 people, and, mm. uh, two partners. And the best part about our team is we have a fantastic group of people. We have all been working together. Most of us have been working together for north of 10 years in various iterations and uh, it's a very flat hierarchical structure and everyone loves movies and loves working together. So we are very fortunate to have just a wonderful group of people and everyone wants to put the best content on the screen. That's great. That's, in, that's hopeful and inspiring to hear. And even though you say that you're fortunate to have a great team, I'm going to have to assume that you had a hand in it <laughs> in putting together an amazing team. And it sounds like you attract really great people and great projects. Um, oh, so thank you. <laughs> so thank you so much, uh, Barry. I'm going to say your last name like an Israeli, Mayrovich, because <laughs> I can't do the English translation. I'll let you do that. Um, any last words you want to leave us with? There's much more good than there is evil. And we hope that Irena's vow, when people hear the story, it's a real bright light in the world today. And uh, that's why we're working really hard from a grassroots perspective to try to have as many people in the world see the movie. And uh, we're hoping that it's going to have a lot of word of mouth because it's an important movie for young people to see and for people of all generations to see, to, to respect the past, but also to embrace the message because one act of kindness can go a long way for people. Yeah, very well said and a really stark reminder of the role that writers, filmmakers, artists have in our society in reminding us of what's possible. And doubly so when the reminder of what's possible and, and what humans are really like is uh, is not fictional, that it's a real story of, of, uh, of what humans can do for each other. So um, thank you for the 
seven years and then some of work to make get this film made and out there. And uh, for viewers, we have a link to it below this video. Definitely highly recommend uh, checking it out. Barry, thank you so, so much for joining us here. Mila. Lovely okay. to meet you. You've subscribed to my channel. You love these videos. It's time for that 90-minute masterclass where I help you eliminate writing blocks and arrive at your best screenplays. Join me at the independentfilmschool.com. Link is below and I'll invite you to my training. It is absolutely free. I'll see you there.